it is not, it is not too simplistic to say that the gospel is the answer. My guest, Lee Strobel, one of the best-selling apologists in the world. You've read his books, seen his videos, heard his talks. Maybe it started with the case for Christ himself, an atheist in the past, a journalist, and through that went an investigative journalistic discovery until he came to realize Jesus indeed, Savior and Lord, and he has joyfully served him these many years. Lee, it's a delight to have you on the line of fire. Hey, Michael, how are you? I'm doing well. And for those hearing Lee's enthusiastic voice, that's how he is. Whenever I've been around him and <laughs> hours we spent together years back, that, that is Lee. Jesus really changed your life, didn't he? Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, I did a book recently called The Case for Grace, and it's all about God's ability to transform lives. And I think in my own life, having lived a very immoral and narcissistic and self-absorbed and self-destructive kind of a life, uh, for many years as a hedonist, figuring that if God doesn't exist, then the most logical way to live life is just to pursue pleasure. And then uh, having my wife come to faith in Christ, which almost blew our marriage apart because I wanted to divorce her. I didn't want to be married to a Christian, um, being an atheist. And um, and yet being attracted through the change in her life, um, uh, which was winsome and was attractive. And so I decided to use my journalism training and legal training to investigate. Uh, and that's the wonderful thing about Christianity. It is an investigatable religion. And uh, so I just used those skills that I learned at journalism school and law school and at the Chicago Tribune uh, to investigate uh, science, cosmology, physics, biochemistry, genetics, human consciousness, all of which they uh, p- uh, point powerfully toward the existence of a creator, and then especially history, the uh, um, you know, the, the question of uh, did Jesus live, did he die, was he resurrected from the dead, uh, your incredible contribution in the area of the fulfillment of the biblical prophecies in Jesus. Uh, I remember interviewing you for my book, The Case for the Real Jesus. Yes. What a joy, what a joy that was, uh, and what a blessing your research has been to so many millions of lives. And um, so, you know, coming to faith on November the 8th of 1981, um, and finding out my wife, unbeknownst to me, had been praying a prayer for me these whole two years that I was on this investigative journey. I was uh, from Ezekiel thirty six twenty six says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And she prayed that for me. And uh, sure enough, over time, God changed my character, my morality, my values, my worldview, my philosophy, my attitudes, uh, my relationships, my priorities, my marriage, and everything. And um, so it's been a it's been a revolution. And and then to see my children come to faith and now serving Christ. My son's a professor at Biola University with a Ph.D. in theology from the University of Aberdeen. And uh, my daughter writes Christian books with her husband. Uh, children's books to teach young people about God. And then, and Michael, you're going to love this, my 10-year-old granddaughter, Abigail, uh, just went on her first missions trip with wow. some young people from her church, slept on the floor of a church for a week uh, in a little town that was a poor, poverty-stricken town. And I've got actually a picture, a photograph of her sharing Jesus with another little girl and leading her to faith in Christ. Incredible. So, the, you know, the generations being affected by the gospel. Yeah, just just extraordinary. I was talking yesterday to Dr. Richard Land from Southern Evangelical Seminary, and after the radio broadcast, we are just talking about life having no meaning if there is no God. Yeah. And my wife Nancy, when we met at the age of 19, both Jewish, but she was a hardcore atheist. I'd been a believer for two and a half years, and God saved her and brought us together. But we've often talked about the mindset of an atheist, and she's tried to help me to understand it mm-hmm. because I never was an atheist. But... I imagine if I was an atheist and I had no philosophical answer to how we got here or where we're going, I'd basically say this much I know. When I do this, I feel good. When I do this, I feel bad. So I'm going to try to do the things that make me feel good and basically live my life like that. And because I feel good when I do good for other people also, then if I have kids or grandkids, then then I'll try to make them feel good also. I mean, it it pretty much would boil down to that, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's to me, you know, I'm a logical person. I, my background's in journalism and law, which are very evidentially based fields. And, and so I looked logically at it as an atheist. I said, okay, if there is no God, 
if there is no heaven, if there is no hell, if there is no ultimate accountability, if there is no judgment, then the most logical, to me, way to live my life was as a hedonist. I might as well just pursue pleasure in this world. Uh, You know, everybody else, forget it. You you know, I'm I'm, I'm in it for me, and I'm just going to enjoy myself as much as I can. And so I lived a very drunken life. I mean, what people saw was me winning awards for investigative reporting at the Chicago Tribune. What they didn't see was the other side, which was me literally drunk in an alley in the snow on Saturday night. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, I, so I live this very immoral life with a lot of anger because you know, what happens, uh, Michael, is, you know, when you pursue pleasure, when that's your highest goal, um, everything lets you down. Nothing lives up to the hype. Right. So you, you end up getting this rage built up in you because you can't, you can't um, find that ultimate uh, experience of pleasure. You can't get that perfect high. And so I had so much rage in me. I remember my wife and I, after she became a Christian, which made me mad enough, she was talking about going to church, and I just blew up. And my little daughter was there and my wife, and I reared back and I kicked a hole right through our living room wall, just out of rage. And and they're, and they're both crying, and uh, but that that was what our life was like uh, without Christ. Extraordinary. Do you, do you think, even aside from your wife coming to faith, the way you were living, that your marriage would have lasted long term? Oh, no, no, no way. I mean, no, especially when I was only interested in myself. I was only interested in keeping myself happy. I didn't care that much about other people. Now, obviously, I cared about my wife. We met when we were 14 years old. We were childhood sweethearts. But, um, you know, she was agnostic, so she had no belief in God. Uh, So we were fairly compatible spiritually. Um, But I have no doubt that had had both of us not come to faith, that... um, you know, we just recently celebrated our 44th wedding anniversary. Mm. That just wouldn't have happened. And I'll tell you what else wouldn't have happened. My son, three years ago, uh, and his wife uh, named their first uh, uh, son, um, our first grandson, after me. And that would not have happened had yeah. I grown, had I raised my children um, in that atheist environment that I had been in and, and modeled the kind of a life that was full of selfishness and uh, immorality. Right, so you think of the ripple effect just within your own family of Jesus saving you, the marriage preserved, the kids raised in a certain environment, yep. instead of getting drunk, instead of sleeping around, the godly grandchildren. You multiply that through the generations, and you see the impact of the gospel. Then you take, the, so that's the immediate ripple effect, but then you take the ripple effect of the tens of millions that God's enabled you to touch and minister to who have come to faith and you just see what can happen when Jesus really changes somebody. And, and you know what's amazing, Michael, is it all started with a plate of cookies. You know, we think, <laughs> well, how can we reach out to people? How can we share the gospel? How can we engage a neighbor or a colleague or someone? Our whole journey started because we moved into a condominium uh, in a new building, and the woman downstairs was a Christian. And she one day knocked on the door and brought us a plate of homemade cookies. And that simple gesture of friendship resulted in um, Leslie, my wife, becoming best friends with Linda the Christian. And it was through her influence that uh, Leslie became a believer. And it was through Leslie's influence that I became a believer. And you know, I think of all these books and all the speaking and all this stuff. It all goes back to this one Christian woman who said, I'm going to take a risk, and there's a new neighbor, and I'm going to bring a plate of cookies, and I'm going to pray the Holy Spirit would somehow spark a conversation where I might be able to present the gospel. What I love about that is we can all do that. We can all bake a plate of cookies and share it with someone and pray, God, you know, I'm willing. Just, uh, you know, open up a conversation. Let me me share you with someone else, and then who knows what's going to happen from there. Yeah, and it leads to a son getting a Ph.D. at the University of Aberdeen and now training a generation of people at a Christian university, yeah. leads to a granddaughter sharing her faith on the mission field. And, and Lee, we, we've got a minute before the break, but yeah. it really comes down to caring about other people. If you love them, then you'll do what you can to touch them. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, we take a bit of a risk, but it's never a risk, really, when when Jesus is in it. And, and what's the worst thing that can happen? Are they going to get mad at you for giving them a plate of cookies? I don't think so. <laughs> We're not really risking much when we uh, walk out in faith and, and pray that God will use us. Absolutely. Hey, friends, you can hear Lee Strobel face-to-face at the annual Southern Evangelical 
Seminary Apologetics Conference, one of the premier, if not the premier, apologetics conferences in the nation, October 13th through 15th. I've spoken at it quite a few times myself. 13th is for women only, then 14th, 15th. If you can't make it to the conference, you can live stream. Find out more at ses.edu. That's S-E-S dot E-D-U. All right, I've got a few more joyful minutes with Lee Strobel, his latest book, The Case for Grace. Welcome back to The Line of Fire. This is Michael Brown, my guest, best-selling Christian author, apologist, Lee Strobel. Lee, you've interviewed leading intellectuals. You have spoken with physicists, biologists, scientists, philosophers, wide range of people. These are Christian intellectuals, people of faith, people who love the Lord. In all of your time and asking the questions that you do in your, your books, beginning with The Case for Christ, what stands out to you? A couple of, of encounters you had where you were blown away by the evidence. I, I know I'm asking a big question because you can give me sure. so many, but whatever pops in your mind, just one of these wow yeah. moments sitting with some of these people. Well, with one, of, one that pops in mind is uh, I got the chance to interview uh, Dr. Bruce Metzger before he died. Dr. Metzger, of course, one of the great scholars on the uh, text of the New Testament, um, a textual critic, as they say, someone that studies the actual text and, and the Greek and Hebrew. And, and um, Dr. Metzger, uh, an eminent scholar, um, highly respected, Princeton University, written yep. many great books. And at the end of our interview, I said to him, you know, the president of the United States every year gives a speech called the State of the Union. I said, what is the state of Bruce Metzger's soul? After all this research, all this scholarship, and, and I said, how has your great learning has it taken you toward faith or away from faith? And he said, oh, well, all of my learning, all that I've learned, the studies of a lifetime have all brought me closer to Christ. He said, uh, you know, the, all of the data, all of the evidence um, gives me uh, ever more confidence that my faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior is well-placed. Uh, and just mm. he just went on and on. It's his most beautiful statement of, of faith and conviction. And, you know, uh, and at the end of it, I was so moved emotionally by it. I said, Dr. Metzger, can I just pause and pray and thank God for your lifetime of uh, helping people see the truth of who you are? And, and I prayed for him, and, and uh, that, that just really blew me away. Um, uh, I, I was also blown away by one scholar who told me, nobody's going to read your book. And um, mm. I said, really? He said, oh, yeah. He said, uh, especially young people, nobody cares about apologetics or evidence for the faith anymore. And really? so, yeah, so I got all depressed. I went home. I said to Leslie, nobody's going to read my book. I'm wasting my time. So, you know, I, I, I wrote the book, and, and by God's grace, it, it um, sold millions of copies. But here's the, 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 the counterintuitive thing. The single biggest group of people who've written me or contacted me saying they've come to faith in Christ through the book, The Case for Christ, has been 18 through 24-year-olds. Really? Young people. Young people. They are interested, Michael. They care about truth. They care about... Um, um, uh, evidence. Um, in fact, um, I, I just saw something recently by uh, Dave Kinneman, who does a lot of research. He interviewed yes. 5,000 young people, and this is what he said. This generation wants and needs truth, not spiritual soft serve. He said, this is a generation hungry for substantive answers to life's biggest questions. So people are interested, and young people are interested. Um, uh, you know, I was fascinated by a headline in Christianity Today magazine that said, apologetics makes a comeback among youth. Um, so, you know, I, I think that is counterintuitive to me. You think in this postmodern world where you're, you have your truth and I have my truth, the young people don't really care about the ultimate truth of who God is and, and what that means for us. But they are interested. Yeah, and, and, you know? and, yeah, and, and that would verify <clears throat> what we say is that ultimately – people need God, recognize something's wrong. In other words, when you go the way of the world, it fails at a certain point. So Absolutely. as much as people are talking about relative reality and and Bruce Jenner is the woman of the year and Rachel Dolezal is black, and if you believe right. you're a cat, you're a cat, right. uh, that, that plenty of other people think so, something's just not right here. Something's yeah, just, exactly. just not right. And uh, I was doing a, a big conference in Korea uh, oh, maybe six weeks ago, and it was focusing on youth. And one, one fellow, he's probably in his 40s, 
but he does youth ministry all around the world. He said today's young people are under challenged. Mm. So it's the exact opposite of what most people are thinking and what the church is doing, you know, when they soft sell and just try to make Jesus this pop star. It's like yeah. the, the kids don't want that. That's Show right. them the real Jesus. Tell them, leave everything and follow him and you'll get yourself a disciple. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. You know, uh, you know we look at kids and, and sometimes we think we've got to entertain them. And, um, you know, I have a friend who says, don't teach young kids the Bible. Don't teach it to them. Train them in it. Train. There's a difference between just teaching something and training them. And uh, what he likes to do is take his Sunday school class of young people, train them in what the Bible teaches and how to defend it. Then he takes them to uh, Salt Lake City on a missions trip, and they witness to Mormons about the truth of Christianity. And And it forces them to really think through, what do I believe? And how do I articulate it? Yeah, just hands on. And and then when you live it out, first you realize, wow, I didn't know this. I'm not ready for this. Then you realize, wow, people are coming and, wow, we need the Holy Spirit to work. And it's so life changing. Lee, uh, you could go on with this for hours, but how is it you have maintained your joy, your vitality, your zeal in the Lord? We've just got a couple minutes before Mm. we're done, but could you give us a key or two? You know, for, for me, I am very much in touch of where I had been as an atheist. I, I never forget the emptiness, the immorality, the um, selfishness. Uh, I, 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 I never want to forget what I had been like, because it just brings me joy to see how God takes even a life like mine and turns it around and infuses me with, uh, uh, you know, different values and different character and different morality, different worldview. And, uh, you know, it's such a contrast that it just brings me joy when I think about it. I get to tell my testimony, golly, several times a week before various groups. And, and, and so when I tell it every time, I have to tell what life was like before <laughs> Christ. And it just reminds me of the joy there is in following Jesus. Uh, amazing. And your newest book, The Case for Grace, what does that open up? You know, that, that talks about, um, you know, how God can transform lives. There's stories about murderers and uh, uh, adulterers and all kinds of people in there who find Jesus, and their lives are turned around in amazing ways. One of my closest friends in the world, Yesu Padam in India, planted probably over 8,000 churches with his workers and built hospitals and orphanages and highly respected by the, the government. Uh, he was an untouchable who, at the age of 11, became a Naxalite, which is a, a radical Maoist communist in India, signed with his own blood, and mm. became an atheist, alcoholic, basically communist terrorist when Jesus appeared to him in his mid-20s and radically transformed his life. In that instant, he, he went out of the meeting where he was, this Christian meeting, he went out of the meeting and began to clap his hands and shout on the street, <laughs> have you heard, have you heard, and started preaching Jesus. Oh, that's great. It gives me chills. Yeah, so, yeah, amazing, amazing grace. Uh, so, so, Lee, thanks for your shining example. Keep burning bright, and look forward to having you at the Apologetics Conference. Thank you, Michael. God bless you. Love you. Love what you're doing. Blessings on you and all your listeners. Thank you so much.